Where do we start with this? With, uh, yeah, with Barry Weiss. Well, it's, there's, there's a couple of things with Barry Weiss. We'll keep kind of go, circling back to Barry Weiss because there's a lot going on there. But um, Barry was, Weiss was one of the authors of the Harper's Magazine letter, and it was a letter signed by, I think, 150 different intellectuals, mainly writers and, and professors at university, that basically was against uh, cancel culture. And it was the, against the idea that people are being fired People have been uh, 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 people have been um, uh, attacked on Twitter, have been ganged up against on Twitter. Uh, reputations have been destroyed. Uh, y- you know, th- th- there's really this attitude of going after people who whose ideas don't agree with the nutty left. And uh, you know, J.K. Rollins is a good example. She's written some essays about uh, transgender, which the nutty left does not like. They've organized boycotts of her books. They go after her on Twitter. They attack her. They, they do all this stuff. You know, I don't know if it's come to physical threats. I think, I think threats have been made. I don't know if it's come to physical violence. But they have been, in speech, they have attacked, ridiculed, shunned her and, and encouraged others to do the same. And they've encouraged people, of course, to, to boycott, uh, to boycott her, uh, her books. Uh, so, so this was a, this was a, 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 a uh, and I had, I had it here. I've got too many windows open, and uh, I had the, uh, there it is, the letter. It's called a, a, uh, a letter on justice and open debate. Good for them. They, they didn't make it a, a about free speech because it's open debate, and, and, they, and they write in this, in this letter, the stifling atmosphere will ultimately harm the most vital causes of our time. The restrictions on debate, whether by repressive government or an intolerant society, invariably hurts those who lack power and make everyone less capable of democratic participation. The way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument, and persuasion, not by trying to silence or wish them away. We refuse any false choice between justice and freedom, which cannot exist without each other. That's right, that's good. Not that I think they understand what justice or freedom really means. As writers, we need a culture that leaves us the room for experimentation, risk-taking, and even mistakes. We need to preserve the possibility of good faith disagreement without dire professional consequences. If we don't defend the very thing on which our work depends, we shouldn't expect the public or state to defend it for us. All right. So there's a lot of good. Uh, there's a lot of good there. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of the letter. And as I said, people from a wide diversity of points of view, uh, a fairly wide diversity of points of view, mainly centrists, I'd say, but some conservatives and libertarians and some leftists signed this letter. And then there was a, a, a flurry of, of letters uh, following it. And, and, and one of the things that was interesting was um, that, let me find this, uh, this little story. Um, you know, a friend of... Uh, a friend of Barry Weiss's, um, a friend of Barry Weiss's, who organized Barry Weiss. I don't know if you guys know who Barry Weiss was, because I certainly really didn't know Barry Weiss that well, right? Um, it's uh, one second. Let me just find this thing. Yeah. Okay. So a friend of Barry Weiss, Barry Weiss is, it was a New York Times uh, columnist. She was, uh, she was part of the editorial board of the op-ed page. She was brought in after 2016 to increase the diversity of ideas and to encourage, uh, to bring in kind of other points of view other than the traditional leftist points of view that the New York Times editorial page had covered. Um, Barry Weiss is, is a centrist. Uh, you know, the, the, she came to my attention when she wrote, um, I think, a pretty famous story for the New York Times about the intellectual dark web, and she kind of named them, and there were pictures there of Eric Weinstein and, and, uh, and Dave Rubin, and uh, she criticized Dave Rubin a little bit, but she, she generally brought to the forefront the intellectual dark web and into kind of the mainstream media. And uh, the, uh, so she... So she's kind of middle of the road. She's not a conservative. She's not on the right in any kind of sense. She's probably uh, pretty 
what traditionally what would be considered left on social issues and 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 you know more conservative maybe on uh, on issues of economics so kind of a, a, a traditional centrist and uh, she signed this letter at Harper magazine and then a few days later resigned from the New York Times and her letter of resignation is is really is really interesting because what she articulates in the letter of resignation is the atmosphere that exists in the New York Times, not for some rabid pro-capitalist, not for some you know, uh, objectivist or, or free market type or, or even a conservative, but no, but for, for somebody like Barry Weiss, who is generally pro-Israel, so maybe a little to the right on issues of Israel, anti-antisemitism, um, but generally, again, nothing radical, nothing radical, pretty, pretty much centrist, right? Um, and the kind of treatment she got at the New York Times. And first of all, she says what happens in the New York Times is that Twitter, Twitter, actually plays a role in editing articles in the New York Times. Because Twitter, the response on Twitter to any New York Times article, is what editors have on their minds during the editorial process. The paper basically customizes and changes its articles so that not to offend the nutty left on Twitter. She says stories, she quotes stories are chosen and told in a way to satisfy the narrowest of audiences rather than to allow a curious public to read about the world and then draw their own conclusions. This is the New York Times. And then she says she was brought in to offer some diversity of ideas. But that during her time at the paper, and this has gotten worse, several colleagues she quote, quote, several colleagues perceived to be friendly with me were badgered by co-workers. co-workers. My work and my character are openly demeaned on company-wide Slack channels. Some co-workers insist I need to be rooted out if the company is to be truly inclusive, while others post axe emojis next to my name. Still, other New York Times employees publicly smear me as a liar and a bigot on Twitter with no fear that harassing me will be met with appropriate actions. Now, she writes that, these are, that she could sue the paper. Theoretically, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't threaten us, but she says this is unlawful discrimination, hostile work environment, and, 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 and you know, the fact is that The publisher, the owners, the bosses of the New York Times do nothing about this. Indeed, the opposite, she says. They stand, they, they would um, actually praise her in private for her courage and then let her co-workers harass her constantly. They would never speak out. They would not defend her. At least this is her story. She says... At some point, quote, showing up for work as a centrist at an American newspaper should not require bravery. That's how bad things are at the New York Times. Uh, She says it's getting worse, significantly worse. Op-eds that would have been published two years ago would not be published today. The internal backlash is immense. Of course, we talked about on this show a few weeks ago about the op-ed that Tom Cotton wrote that uh, caused the firing of, uh, of, the, edit, of, the, of the, the guy responsible for the op-ed page. And uh, they fawn over anybody from the wacky left, no matter what their views are. So you can be as wacky as you want to be to the left, but the center is unacceptable. 
And why, she says. You know, because people want to be perceived as righteous. People want to go along. People are afraid. People are afraid of losing their jobs. People are afraid of, of, of the masses, of, the, of, of being ridiculed, of being, quote, canceled on Twitter. People are afraid of their future jobs, of their career. She says, standing up for your principle at the paper does not win plaudits. Nobody's going to support you. So nobody right now, nobody is standing up on principle. Everybody is just cowering and following the party line. She says the real damage, and this I think is quite powerful, the real damage is to young writers. Young writers now follow these rules. Quote, rule one, speak your mind at your own peril. Rule two, never risk commissioning a story that goes against the narrative. Rule three, never believe an editor or publisher who urges you to go against the grain. Eventually, the publisher will cave to the mob, the editor will get fired or reassigned, and you'll be hung out to dry. For these young writers and editors, there's one conclusion. There's places like the, the, the New York Times and other once great journalistic institutions betray their standards and lose sight of their principles. Yep. Just follow, you know, just, just don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. So it's... tragic. But we all know this to some extent about the New York Times. But that somebody like her would be harassed in the way she has... That is really new. I mean, to remind you, the New York Times used to be the paper of record, even though it was responsible for, for example, I, we talked about uh, just this week, the, the Durante in the 1930s, it was responsible for um, communist propaganda. It's been left-wing for pretty much ever. On the other hand, it also published Henry Hazlitt. For many years, he was the economic writer, Henry Hazlitt, the, the writer of economics in one lesson, a great free market economist. It used to be, at least attempt to be, present the facts and present a wide array of opinion. In 1896, Adolf Urs, I'm not sure who Adolf was, described the paper as, quote, to make of the columns of the New York Times a forum for the consideration of all questions of public importance and to that end, to invite intelligent discussion from all shades of opinion. Obviously, that is no longer the New York Times. It hasn't been for a long time. And um, it's still sad to see somebody who's trying, like Barry Weiss was, to see them have to leave, to, to see them have to kind of cow, in, in a sense, give up. Retreat. Fail. I know there are a lot of super chat questions. We're not going to get to them. I've got to, I will get to them at the end. There's a huge amount of um, huge amount of content that I need to get through before we get to them. So if you want your super chat question to be addressed sooner rather than later, then they're going to have to be on the topic. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to get to housing prices until the end of the show after I finish the topics I preserved. As I said, Andrew Sullivan is leaving the New York Magazine. We'll know more about the details of why he's leaving um, on tomorrow, actually. He's publishing his last column. A Andrew Sullivan, for those of you who don't know, somebody I debated recently. I debated in March. Actually, my last public event was in March at Clemson University with me and Andrew Sullivan on the stage uh, debating. And, um, you know, he's a good man, but he's, he's, a, he's, he's a statist, he's a religionist, um, a, a statist religionist who wants the government to impose, you know, the philosopher kings in government to impose their set of values on all of us, whether it's religious values, whether it's how, you know, how industry should be constructed, whether it's central planning uh, economically, he's anti-capitalist, anti-freedom. He's an excellent writer and an excellent critic of the left and, and uh, is a very powerful writer. I learned a lot from him, particularly on things like intersectionality. He's written some of the best stuff on intersectionality. 
And I think at the end, that's what got him fired. Also, some stuff I guess he wrote about the bell curve uh, in the past. Uh, he, he wrote something. Um, he wrote something favorable about uh, Charles Murray's bell curve. So we'll see tomorrow. It's going to be interesting. Uh, but you can find the debate if you go to uh, uh, YouTube, type in Yaron Brook, Andrew Sullivan, you will find it. It's actually a really good conversation. And I think you'll find it really interesting. And you'll find, what you'll find interesting is the state of conservatism. And this is one of the better conservatives. You know, we agree on things like we both dislike Trump immensely and think he's a disaster for, for the conservative movement. But his perspective on what conservatism is, is, I mean, it's true to conservatism, but it's very, very distant from my views of what the truth is. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want, to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes but uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support, or on Patreon, or Subscribestar, or Locals, uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.